Good evening. I want to welcome all of you to uh, the second conversation uh, in the series uh, that we've just launched this term and that will be continuing throughout the spring semester, just about every couple of weeks, called Communities in Conversation, and that will uh, uh, be ongoing uh, into, into Rhodes' future, one hopes. Um, I want to begin, first of all, uh, just uh, thanking a few people. Um, this is always a shared collaborative enterprise. It's the only way these things work. Um, and I want to begin, uh, first of all, with a, a very strong um, uh, gesture of gratitude to uh, Paul and Phyllis Burrs, without whom uh, it would not have been possible to bring uh, Paul Mendes Floor to Memphis um, uh, through an endowment that uh, they established at the Jewish Community Center. Uh, we were able to partner with them and uh, to make all of this possible. Um, I also want to thank um, John Roan. Um, it's been really wonderful for me um, just getting started at Rhodes to have someone uh, who helps out with all of the details that go into uh, making these events a success. And I, I very much appreciate that um, I have someone uh, like him to work with, as well as with Nanette, uh, Nanette Gills in the history department. Um, and uh, since I wasn't able to, or I didn't recall, uh, didn't remember to thank him last time. I also want to thank um, Jacob Church and uh, John Bass, uh, the director of the Mike Curb Institute. Um, Jacob works with uh, him, and uh, the sound, which sounds really good tonight, is made possible um, through their help and support, as is the fact that all of these uh, uh, Communities in Conversation lectures are being recorded, uh, both so that we can archive these um, lectures. Uh, we're filming a number of them, and we're going to be posting that on the web, uh, either through our Facebook page or through YouTube, uh, or perhaps through uh, an iTunes um, uh, um, channel, um, so that we can disseminate the conversations that we are having here to a larger audience. Ultimately, what Communities and Conversation is all about is really throwing a light on what it is that we're doing in the academy, showing that the kind of work that we do in our classrooms, uh, in our research, in our publications, um, are in fact deeply relevant to a larger public conversation. And so in as many ways as possible, we want to bring the public into that conversation. Today's uh, lecture has been sponsored by a number of different groups uh, all across Rhodes. Um, the Spence L. Wilson Chair in Humanities, the Department of Religious Studies, the African, African, the African American Studies Program, the Bonner Scholars Program, um, as well as by the University of Memphis's program in religious studies. And the ongoing partnership with uh, University of Memphis is a very important one. Part of what we are attempting to do through these conversations is to build intellectual community. Not only build intellectual community across campus, between our various departments on campus, but across all of the cultural sites and centers that make for a creative, um, uh, intellectually engaging life here in Memphis. Uh, I want to also let you know that in just a couple of weeks' time, we'll be bringing in Robert Manukin for the third uh, Communities in Conversation lecture. Uh, that is a partnership that we have with Facing History and Ourselves. It will, again, involve a number of different campus groups. Robert Manukin is the director of Harvard Law School's famous program on negotiation. Uh, he's the author most recently of a book called Bargaining with the Devil, which is the title of the talk that he's going to uh, be giving. This is a lecture that is going to really be of interest, of course, to 
uh, pre-law students. Uh, he teaches in the law school at Harvard, uh, but also to students in business and commerce, and also to uh, scholars across the humanities, because in Mnookin's book, he draws on a number of case studies, not only from business and law, but also from historical contexts in which one has to think through the question of how one negotiates with uh, someone one considers the devil. In other words, uh, uh, malicious, uh, could cause real serious uh, harm. And, and he draws on examples like um, Churchill's decision not to negotiate with Hitler uh, and Mandela's decision to negotiate with de Klerk. Uh, among other interesting ones. So it should be a, a very interesting inter-departmental uh, dialogue, and I, I want to enjoin you to um, join us once more for that. So when you give an introduction to a speaker, it seems to me that there are two main things you seek to accomplish with uh, such an introduction. The first is to flatter the speaker. And after spending two days with Paul Mendes' floor, I know that probably the worst thing that I could do would be to make an effort to uh, flatter him. Because for a scholar of his magnitude, he is extraordinarily humble. Uh, and so I'm not going to do that. I'm, I, I decided not to rework the introduction that I um, gave to him last night, and, and it was an introduction that I think just cut to the chase and as, as simply uh, and as quickly as possible um, indicated why we have in our presence tonight a truly extraordinary scholar. Um, when he sent me his CV, you know, most of our CVs have lots of superfluous uh, uh, matter in them. You know, all the courses that we've taught and uh, I don't know, uh, all the talks that we've given. In Paul's case, he just sent me 20 pages of publications, um, hundreds of articles, uh, uh, numerous books, and even more edited uh, volumes that have been translated into many different languages. I'll just give you uh, a few titles um, that, that may be uh, works that you might want to pick up, uh, and so I mentioned them. Uh, German Jews, uh, a dual identity. If you're looking for a fabulous short uh, primer on Jewish, German Jewish intellectual history from Mendelssohn to uh, the Holocaust, this is the book that you want to pick up. Um, uh, his groundbreaking book on uh, Buber, uh, From Mysticism to Dialogue. Um, and the book that's used in every single course that's taught on modern Jewish history, now in its third edition uh, that he edited with Yehuda Reinhardt's called The Jew in the Modern World. Uh, Paul Mendes Flohr is the uh, editor of the 22 volumes of Buber's work, each volume focusing on a different theme of Buber's scholarship. He is undoubtedly the leading living scholar of Buber, having directly imbibed that from uh, Nachum Glatzer, one of his uh, numerous uh, teachers who was um, Franz Rosenzweig's assistant and who was also close to Buber. Um, he is a leading scholar of German Jewish intellectual history, of Jewish existentialism. He, among numerous, again, numerous um, international awards, the most prestigious is that he was awarded the Humboldt Prize uh, in Germany. This is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Germany, in his case, awarded uh, for the work that he's done in the humanities. So we have in our midst a, a fabulous scholar. And then after he gives his talk, um, which all of you know is entitled Modern Day Prophets, Martin Buber and Martin Luther King, we're very fortunate to have uh, two of our faculty who will open up the conversation with him. Um, I'm not gonna introduce them in any detail because they're ours. We have Mark Musi, 
Um, I only had the pleasure of meeting Mark uh, a short while ago, and, and in that uh, conversation, we talked about the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Mendes Floor was coming to campus and he got very excited because apparently his early work, which is utterly invisible from what we can find on the web, some of his early work dealt with Buber. He published on Buber in his early years. Um, and uh, we also will um, open the questioning with uh, Lou Ivory, Luther Ivory, both from the Department of Religious Studies, who of course has written on Martin Luther King's theology. Um, so, Without further ado, the last thing I want to say is, please, hook a brother up by unhooking your cell phone. Just turn it on silent, and please leave it off and unattended to for the next hour or so as we um, enjoy some reflections on uh, two modern prophets. Thank you. Good evening. The first thing I have to say, Jonathan, is I don't mind flattery. <laughs> you could have gone on. <laughs> um, I'm uh, particularly enjoyed to uh, be here in your beautiful campus and uh, to have what's gracious, due to the graces, um, hospitality of Jonathan to get to, to know your city a bit. I, it's my first time here in Memphis and, of course, in the memory of those who don't live here, perhaps as well, of course, uh, Memphis is associated with the tragic um, end of Martin Luther King's um, life. Um, and the last day and a half since I've been here, I've realized that there's obviously a, another depth, another, other dimensions to, to Memphis, including his, your beautiful campus. Um, I feel a bit um, un, un at ease standing here distance from you. I, Elevated, and uh, of course, we're supposed to have a conversation. And as beautiful as this room is, it doesn't lend itself to conversation and dialogue. Um, and moreover, I'm going to do something to, to violate the, the spirit of the conversation dialogue is to read a paper. It's part of academic uh, formality, and in some sense, it's uh, um, it's noble, but also a bit rude uh, if we want wishes to have a. Uh, communication, dialogue. I'm reminded of a, a saying by the great German poet, uh, Goethe. I'll say in German and translate it. Uh, he once noted that Sprechen is natur, to speak is natural. Hören is kultur, to listen is culture. So you're going to have the burden of being cultured. <laughs> I've, I'm just going to speak what I've written already. Um, so I've um, I hope you'll forgive me, um, and maybe we'll, in the conversation that we'll have at the conclusion of the lecture, uh, which will be read, um, we'll have an opportunity for um, a conversation. I recall, I've, I've, I've taught at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem for 35 years, um, and once I gave a, uh, had a lecture course, of perhaps this, double the size of this, uh, of your, or this audience, and I was uh, obviously on the, on, on a platform and a, lec and a lecture, a lectern, and of course it didn't lend itself to it, uh, to a true pedagogical experience. Um, so when I, was, I was younger and more uh, foolish, I'm still foolish, but I said more foolish. <laughs> um, every time I, I, gave, I mentioned something that I had what was, can be referred to as a footnote, I would simply jump off the stage and give the footnote and then jump back on. I'm not going to do that for you, but <laughs> but just indicates how, uh, I'm, uh, well, my apology for speaking uh, at this distance and in this forum, um, especially given the topic of our, um, of our uh, concern this evening. Uh, Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher, and Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, the eminent um, servant of his people and of all of humanity. A Palestinian friend of mine once observed, a Palestinian Arab friend of mine once observed that his people, the Palestinians, need three Martins, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., and Martin Buber. And my reply was that we Jews, certainly in the state of Israel, which is my home, also need three Martins, urgently so. 
all three, Martin Buber, Martin Luther King Jr. and Martin Luther, each in their distinctive idiom and religious and historical context, represent or rather embody the prophetic pathos. What is the prophetic pathos? And here, um, I'd like to teach you a Yiddish word. Um, you won't hear it, but, but in Yiddish, to complain, uh, one says, kvetch, just try it, kvetch. Uh, you gotta feel it, you know, your whole body cringes when you complain about your own woe, your own disappointment, your own um, anguish. A kvetch is very different than a uh, prophet. A prophet kvetches, but kvetches, kvetches on behalf of the other, those whom he regards to be disinherited, abused, um, subject to injustice. The Bible uh, summarizes the 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 kvetch. In English, you say kvetcherai, the kvetch, the kvetching of the of the prophet. Uh, in many ways, of course, but. I'll choose one passage from the book of Proverbs. Speak out for those who cannot speak, for the right of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And the Hebrew is so beautiful and more nuanced. I'm just going to, I imagine many of you don't know the Hebrew, but I'd just like you to hear the Hebrew. Patach picha ve'eglem eldin kol b'nei chalof. Patach picha shafat tzedek. Proverbs, of course, these Proverbs, uh, the book of Proverbs and the prophetic message, of course, is addressed to all and each of us. As the commandment in the book of Leviticus tells us, Love thy neighbor as thyself, for I am the Lord. I should mention parenthetically um, the commandment I just read and we're all familiar with. Um, is part of what we call the Holiness Code. And it's interspersed with ritual, how we serve God in the ritual stru uh, structure, how we pray to God, and the ethical. The ethical and the, and the devotional are one and the same. It's part of the same uh, spiritual reality that we are enjoined to, um, to realize as um, children of God, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. What love means uh, here in the context of biblical faith uh, is of course an active attitude or concern for the other. As we learn from a few lines after the commandment to love thy neighbor, we are also beckoned to love um, the stranger. That is one who is not, who does not belong to one's immediate community. The biblical concept of a stranger is far-reaching. The stranger may be a pagan, one who does not share one's faith, culture, way of life, or even values, and certainly, of course, may be of a different skin culture, uh, a, a skin complexion. One is to love the stranger because we were strangers in Egypt's land and know what it means to be treated as alien as not belonging. As strangers, we know what it means to be treated with contempt because we were received to be different. The commandment to love the stranger is a commandment to accept difference, to extend our concern, our compassionate concern to those who are different and not just our neighbors, not though, just those who are close to us. Martin Buber and Martin Luther King Jr. did not know each other personally. They never met one another, nor did they ever exchange correspondence or even emails uh, or SMS, as you call it. <laughs> but um, I still don't know how to do that, but as I get older, I'm only 70, I have time. In Jewish tradition, I have another, was it 120, another 50 years to learn how to use a computer and all that. But um, I'm waiting for my grandchildren to tell me that, to teach me. In any event, um, Buba, who died in Jerusalem in 1965 at the age of 87, might have known of King's seminal role in the civil rights movement. Had he known, 
king personally. He certainly would have applauded king's unyielding opposition to injustice. King, on the other hand, knew Buber's writings. And in his famous letter uh, from a, a, a Birmingham jail, he, he cited Buber uh, in a very brief but poignant and significant fashion. And I'd like to quote from that letter, which I'm certain you're all familiar with. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, King writes, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things, objects. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and awful. And here, just to remind you, uh, an I-thou and the I-it relationship, Huber says we have fundamentally two ways of relating to the world, two fundamental attitudes. And the German word, uh, um, for attitude is that Buber uses this several words in German, um, is Haltung, which means the way you hold yourself, the way you posture yourself, the way you are, greet the world. And we can greet the world as objects, as its. This is an it, model of water, which I would love to share with you, but it would be undignified and not that very healthy. Um, uh, but if you ever come to my home in Jerusalem, you're more than welcome to share in my homes. Ash. Uh, we passed and, um, and I welcome anyone here in Jerusalem to come and enjoy the Middle East and um, hospitality and, um, and a genuine dialogue, unlike <laughs> what is provided or allowed in this type of setting. Again, I'm apologizing. In any event, an ayat. Now, ayat, such as, I want to grab this bottle or the microphone or uh, the papers before me, of course, is quite legitimate. There are things. But when we treat our fellow human beings, as it, of course, we're, we're offending, we're violating their humanity. Uh, and there are many subtle ways we treat people as it. Um, when we categorize people um, as tall, short, balding, um, I have an argument with God about, you know, what he, what he Allen once said about um, um, evil, what we call theodicy, how do you justify human suffering? Uh, if there is a God, why did he create evil and bold, boldness? <laughs> um, any event, that was supposed to be a joke. Some of you got it. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, we can categorize people. Uh, older, younger, um, infirm, swift, and, and foot. Uh, black, yellow, white, uh, male, female. Um, and all of this is, of course, to reduce those, uh, the other two categories. Um, as Ralph Ellison, the great uh, Afro-American author, said that we, we see people, but if we uh, do not attend to their inner reality, uh, they are fundamentally invisible. And these categories render other people invisible. Um, we neglect to understand their fellow humanity, but they have, in the language of our religious traditions, a soul and their own experience, their own joys, their own woe, anguish and hopes, um, their own inner reality. Just as we ourselves have an inner reality. And of course we feel the abuse of being treated as a thing, as an it, when uh, others neglect our inner reality, relate to us as, um, well in my case, a bespeckled senior citizen of, um, who has a receding hairline, um, or a professor, whatever you want to call me, which may be accurate in description, but certainly would not at all comprehend my inner reality. Um, and that would certainly be true of each of us. And that's what Buber meant by this, the categories I, thou, and I, it. Um, thou is a, to suggest that our relationship, when we truly relate to another human being, uh, has a religious dimension. Um, and thus the thou sounds churchly, but is meant to be, of course, to, to echo the religious character of and the biblical character, the prophetic uh, quality of relating to another human being as a fellow human being. Sounds simple, but of course it is what, what we fail to do. To return then to the commandment 
to love one's neighbor and a stranger as oneself. Both Buber and King reaffirm this commandment according to the prophetic, the prophetic understanding of love, namely that the full expression of love, carative love, requires justice. And justice involves an understanding of the social and political structures that serve to perpetuate injustice. And apropos, permit me to read a poem by Buber in translation. The poem, uh, the poem is called Power and Love. A hope is too new and too old. I do not know what would remain to us were love not transfigured power and power not straying love. Do not protest that love alone rule. Can you prove it true? But resolve every morning I shall concern myself anew about the boundary between the love deed yes and the power deed no, and pressing forward to honor reality. We cannot avoid using power, cannot escape the compulsion to afflict the world, so let us cautiously in diction and mighty in contradiction, love powerfully. And the words to transform our power, or give expression to our love, our carative concern for the other, for the widows and the orphan, the disadvantaged, the dis disinherited, to give it political expression. And politics means power. To love powerfully means the complement to crown love with justice. For the prophets of Israel, as for Buber and King, Martin Buber and Martin Luther King Jr., justice means social justice. It would suffice to, to cite Isaiah, who destroyed by the prevailing moral turpitude of his beloved Jerusalem, exclaimed, and I read from the scripture, how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She that was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your wine is mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not defend the orphan and the widow's cause does not come before them. I will smelt away your dross as with fire and remove all your alloy. After with you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. Note two things in this passage from Isaiah. First, that righteousness and justice are closely linked. Second, that justice is absent when corruption, bribery, failure to defend the orphan and plead the widow's cause of a social norm. In the patriarchal so social structure of Israel, biblical Israel, those without family to care for them, widows and orphans, but the most vulnerable people in society. And corruption in leadership most often preys on those who defend excuse me, depend the most on that very leadership for equity and fairness. Usually those bereft of other alternative sources of justice. Here justice is the failure to function socially in a way that respects others and defends the weak and the powerless, powerless of society. This is also Martin Luther King's message, which tells, tellingly he often voiced with concepts that resonated Buber's reading of the prophetic calling. In a speech entitled, Breaking the Silence, in which he protested what he regarded to be America's unjust war in Vietnam, he noted, and I quote again from the letter, we in the churches and synagogues have a continuing task but we urge our government to disengage itself from a disgraceful commitment 
We must raise our voices if our nation persists in its pervasive, in its perverse way in Vietnam. We as a nation must undergo a radical transformation of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from thing-oriented, it-oriented society, a it-oriented society, to a person-oriented society, when machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. End of quote. The transformation of values from being thing-oriented, it-oriented, to person-oriented, or I vow-oriented, is captured in a Hasidic story told by Buber. Hasidism, of course, as you all know, is an 18th century movement of popular Jewish mysticism which rose and crystallized in Eastern Europe. Uh, it is told that a Hasidic master, uh, a mystic, mystical mentor, Rebbe, once entered a tavern and noticed two inebriated, drunken peasants talking to one another. And Ivan turned to Boris and said, Boris, do you love me? And Boris said, <laughs> of course I love you. I was supposed to be a drunken laugh. I don't know if that really came across, but I don't drink. I'm, I do, but I don't, you know, <laughs> don't boast about it. But nonetheless, uh, I, I think Jonathan's has promised me a good, a good glass of schnapps this evening afterwards, or right? <laughs> well, at least a good glass of wine. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, and Ivan turns to Boris and says, Boris, you don't love me. I, I mean, to, um, to Boris, says, Boris, you don't love me. Boris, I, I said I love you. I just said I love you, Ivan. No, you don't love it. Come on, I just said it, I love you. And then Ivan says to Boris, if you truly love me, you would know it pains me. To love is to understand the inner reality of the other, the pain and anguish of the other. So also King understood that love requires that we enter sympathetically, empathetically into the inner reality of the other, even with whom we may be in conflict. And I quote from King is the true meaning and the value of compassion, King taught, is obtained when it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to understand his questions, to know his assessment of ourselves. For from this, from excuse me, for from his point of view we may indeed see the basic weakness of our own condition. And if we are mature, spiritually mature, emotionally, intellectually mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called our opposition. There is perhaps another deeper parallel in, or infinity between Buber and King's prophetic politics. A lifelong Zionist and later Israeli citizen, Buber was born in Eastern Europe and uh, came to intellectual um, adulthood in Germany in 1938. At the age of 60, he uh, emigrated to the land of Palestine, which eventually in 1948, um, of course, became the state of Israel. As a lifelong Zionist and later Israeli citizen, Buber was deeply engaged by the conflict with the Arabs of Palestine. This conflict posed not only a political challenge to the Zionist movement, according to Buber, but at bottom challenged, in his judgment, the very soul of the Jewish people and the ethical spiritual resources of Judaism. Just as the Jewish question in Europe, that is, the hesitation of most of the nations of Europe to grant the Jews full emancipation and civil rights, was ultimately a Christian question, testing the resolve of Christians to treat the Jews in accordance with the most pristine and elevated values of the church. So the Arab question in Palestine is ultimately a Jewish question, a test of the moral fiber of the Jewish people to learn somehow to accommodate the, the existential reality of the Palestinians, to love the Palestinians as strangers in our midst, and to do so 
with a resolve to solve the, our conflict in the spirit of a compassionate justice. And King would similarly say that slavery, segregation, and the poverty that continues to blight the Afro-American community is ultimately a white man's question, a challenge to white America and its ethical and spiritual resources to solve at long last the awful legacy of slavery. In urging his fellow Jews to solicit actively peace and justice with the Arabs of Palestine, Buber rem reminded his people, the Jewish people, that they were the children of Amos. In Hebrew we say, B'nai Amos. I practice in a hotel how to say Amos, because I naturally say Amos, but in Hebrew is Amos, in English you say Amos. I, got it. I hope I got it right, Amos. Cain would chime in and say the Christians, black and white, were also to regard themselves as the, true, the children of the biblical prophets. Hence, they should not remain indifferent to the suffering of others, even if it involved civil disobedience. Writing from the jail in Birmingham, Martin Luther King observed, and I quote again, we can never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. But I am sure that during that time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers, even if it was illegal. Neither King nor Buber were political revolutionaries. They did not subscribe to a set blueprint of political action to marshal a utopia or the Messiah redemption. They were simply haunted by the biting injustice that surrounded them and felt obliged and divinely commanded to quench on behalf of the, down, the downtrodden, the disinherited, the abused, the widows and the orphans. As the poem by Buber I read before about the tension between love and power indicates the prophetic pathos also commands us to be alert to the complexity and danger of power, of politics. Buber thus remarked that one must be both, and using the Greek, homo, a homo problematicus, and that's at the same time a homo problem politicus. At one hand, we are to be aware of the complexity of, of power, of the structures of power, the use of power, on the other hand, we also beckon to, to be political, to make decisions, to engage in politics. It's a tension uh, that would make, renders politics sensitive to it, the reality of politics, but also alert for the need, the paradoxical need to be political. If love is to be crowned with justice, if the source of injustice is to be alleviated, the social, economic, political structures of society that perpetuate um, the outrage of injustice are to be re removed. Buber and King embody this tension. It is by virtue of a delicate balance of humility and decisiveness that they maintain an intellectual integrity and willingness to walk alone, as was the case of the prophets of yore. They were each prepared to be outsiders, to question the prevailing consensus, and vocally dissent when they deemed it necessary, with respect to social and political issues, morally necessary. Their civil courage, or rather moral courage, is given eloquent expression in a poem by the great Indian I uh, think of uh, philosopher and poet Tagore, with whom they shared fundamental spiritual sensibilities. The poem, Walk Alone, was tellingly adopted by Mahatma Gandhi, one of Martin Luther King's sources of inspiration. It was adopted by him as his movement's 
um, um, emblem and, and, and um, an anthem was put the, the song. If no one answers your call, then walk alone. Walk alone, walk alone, walk on alone. If no one says a thing, or you, unlucky soul, if faces are turned away, if all go on fearing, then open your heart. You speak up what's on your mind. You speak alone. If they turn their, all their backs on you, you unlucky soul, if at the time of talking, of, excuse me, of taking that deep, dark path, no one cares, then walk alone. If a lamp no one shows on your unlucky, on, oh, your unlucky soul, if in a rainstorm on a dark night they bolt their doors, then in a flame of thunder lighting your ribs go on, burning alone, walk alone, walk alone, you unlucky soul. To honor the legacy of Martin Luther King and Martin Buber, we are beckoned to continue their march, to love powerfully, to seek compassionate justice for our neighbors and the stranger in our midst, even when we walk alone. Thank you. And I think, uh, why don't we get started with uh, uh, Professor Ivory first. Um. Thank you. How are you doing out there? Very good. I enjoyed uh, this uh, presentation by you, Dr. Paul. I really appreciate it. And also the way you uh, uh, tried to weave in both the ethical piece as well as the devotional piece. I would like you to talk to us a little bit more about the prophetic pathos. What distinguishes a prophet who has a prophetic consciousness, is uh, prone to prophetic utterance, who walks uh, on the ground in the midst of situations of oppression with a certain type of vision, a certain type of analysis, and a certain type of practice? What distinguishes that individual from someone who just wants to do good stuff? Right. <laughs> Thank you for your, your, your eloquent uh, summation of the issues. And, um, I guess ultimately, not, for someone who wants to be good, <laughs> uh, I, I guess in some basic sense, there's not much difference. But there is, I perhaps, one important difference. Um, of course, this is elementary. The prophet is not a seer, and not someone who just sees the future. That is, of course, a, a misreading uh, of the prophetic... Uh, um, message or prophetic posture or consciousness. It is true the prophet speaks on, or at least intimates, uh, a vision uh, of, a, of, a, of a, a divinely sanctioned um, possibility. But at the same hand, the prophetic vision as a promise is also a responsibility that we are to, to realize. Um, the emphasis is on our responsibility to participate with that, um, with God, so to speak, in, in the realization of that, of that promise. Um, it's what we often call um, hope. And here, allow me just a um, slightly academic comment. Uh, I should really jump back down to the bottom of the stage. <laughs> um, a very good uh, friend and colleague at the, uh, in Jerusalem um, was truly the man who sponsored my appointment at the Hebrew University. Um, once noted that there's a fundamental difference between hope and optimism. And he coined that distinction um, by reference to elliptical, indirect reference to Augustine by saying that uh, 
Optimism is a natural vice. Hope is a supernatural virtue. Now, let me explain. Um, you asked me if I slept well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in hotels, I don't really sleep that well. And I, I don't have a television at home, but when you're in a hotel, you flip on the TV, and, and then you, you say, why are you doing that? And, and they end up not sleeping very well. Um, uh, if you don't sleep very well, you get up in the morning, you're, you're cranky. Uh, the times when you slept well, or you had a great meal, or you had wonderful experiences in the Navy that accompanied you to, to your nocturnal slumber, uh, and you get up feeling wonderful. In other words, uh, optimism is mercurial. It's dependent on your experience and your emotions and, and your dreams, whatever. Uh, it's unpredictable. Um, whereas hope is a theological or religiously engaged or um, commanded posture. Um, our traditions, Jewish and Christian and his Muslim traditions, oblige us to have hope, despite the fact that we may be profoundly pessimistic, <laughs> despondent. Uh, hope is a vision um, of, a, of a better, if you want to put it, more just world, a world in which compassion and love prevails, but it's our responsibility, and therefore it's a religious commandment. And the prophets speak on behalf of hope, despite the fact that we may really have a uh, despairing evaluation of reality. I can tell you as an Israeli, I'm very despairing, but I know I'm also to hope, and that's to energize my political commitment. I noticed this with uh, Martin King, that he, in his speeches, and you quoted uh, several of them, especially you quoted Breaking Silence on Vietnam, you also quoted the letter from Birmingham Jail, sort of 63, but King makes uh, uh, copious use of the prophets of Israel. He, he loved to quote Amos, or Amos, as you would say. He loved to quote uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Hosea. Does a, does a person uh, do you do you feel that in the connection between Buber and King with the I and Thou stuff and King quoting Buber, uh, do you feel that the connection there is 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 somehow tied to this notion in the uh, uh, in the Hebrew prophets? Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Oh yes, certainly. I think I sought to underscore that in what I read, uh, but uh, the prophetic pathos is what inspires their behavior, uh, their action, their political vision, their commitment. Um, both Buber and, and Martin Luther King were schooled on the Hebrew scripture um, and, and internalized the message of the Hebrew scripture, particularly of, of the prophets, most, de most undoubtedly. Yeah. And uh, my, fi my final query to you is this, is that if someone is prophetic and they're not drawing from the prophets of ancient Israel, but they do have a, a burning desire to wrestle or with the great uh, oppression in situations. And you mentioned King's triple evils, racism, poverty, and war and violence. It, if they're not tied to the prophetic tradition, the written prophets or unwritten prophets, do they, would they still possess a prophetic conscience? In other words, can the rest of us too, who don't know much about Amos and Hosea and Ezekiel, can we still claim uh, our uh, membership in the guild, in the prophetic guild, the way Boomer did and the way King did? Yeah. I'm certain you do, and I'll give you a membership card. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, there's a paradigm, and clearly there are prophetic figures throughout the world who are not uh, uh, directly in, uh, inspired by the monotheistic traditions. Um, I assume a truly believing Jew and Christian Muslim would say that uh, our belief that is anchored in, in scripture gives us that much more added um, determination, if you wish, empowerment, spiritual empowerment to take this role. Um, but undoubtedly, it's, just, it's a universal paradigm. Yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me echo Professor Ivory's uh, appreciation of your comments, uh, Dr. Mendez Flora. I found them very moving and inspiring. Uh, so thank you so much. My question has to do with uh, Uber's understanding of the relationship of the I, thou, I, it worlds. Uh, basically what uh, Buber is telling us is that we ought to treat all persons as thou's and not as it's, a, a lot like what Kant said in one of his formulations of the categorical imperative. 
But one of the things that I've never quite understood uh, about Buber's understanding of the I-thou relationship is, is really how we get from the experience of I-thou to treating all persons as thous. Uh, in my reading of Buber, I, I understand the I-thou relationship to be very episodic. It's fleeting. It's something that can't be coerced. It's uh, something like uh, what the other Martin, Martin Luther would call grace. It's something that just happens to you uh, without any preparation. How do you go from that experience of something over which you have no control to being able to treat other persons as thou's? Right. Well, it's a, a very fine question, and it certainly reflects that you read Buber carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you will recall that Buber does use the term grace. Um, mm -hmm. I thou is both an attitude, uh, this halto, the way you posture yourself, mm -hmm. um, in other words, the way you're prepared to greet the world, meet the world, uh, and meet the other, uh, particularly of the fellow human being. Bupa also speaks about meeting animals and inanimate objects like trees in a dialogical, I thou fashion. But we'll bracket that because that's a complicated issue. Um, other than saying that, you know, just that, let me talk about a tree, because uh, it confounds many. Uh, suddenly, what do you mean having a dialogue with a tree? Is, uh, Bub is suddenly throwing in a mystical moment that, that confounds us. Uh, but it's associated with what he calls um, what is exclusive. Uh, and let me explain that. You can pass a tree every day, as I often do, and suddenly one day the tree stands out in its, in its, uh, in its, its beauty, or its, 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 even you can say personality. It, and, and what is meant by exclusive is no longer just simply in your own mind, in your own consciousness, a tree, but it has a distinctive quality. And that is true of our fellow human beings. I, I know very few of you personally. I've met some of you last night, and, and I, I hope we'll continue our friendship, or at least let our, the budding of our friendship bl blossom. Um, but um, if I have a relationship with you, your exclusive, exclusive, exclusiveness, in German says, Ausfliedigkeit, you know, taking one person out of the categories of, uh, of that we define, with which we define the world, um, and acknowledge and confirm the individual as an individual who is no longer simely a category, or simply a tree, or a flower, or a, or a dog. Um, Buber spoke about cats and horses. He loved house cats and dog, horses, but nonetheless. Um, um, and when he speaks about having his favorite horse, is that when he patted the horse and rode the horse, he realized that the soul of the, there was a soul to the horse and developed that relationship. And of course, that's um, not quite an I-thou or an I-you relationship or fully dialogical, but it's recognition that each of us are, have an individual reality. Uh, it is true I-thou relationships are interpersonal, intersubjective. Um, so it's both a posture and then what is grace is the meeting, that every meeting has the possibility of calling upon us to respond. Um, it's not necessary every time you meet somebody to, to pause and have a full dialogical relationship, but to be alert when that person has, uh, stands before you in need. Um, and Buber, when he speaks theologically, says, God addresses us through the other. Um, I think last night I told a story, and if you'll permit me just to repeat it, um, Buber came to his understanding of the I thou relationship uh, through his own struggles as a human being. He was, um, he liked praise, he was narcissistic like most of us. Um, and we know various in, uh, personal infirmities he had and experiences and drive to be a productive scholar so he would be very jealous about his time. And, I noticed from Buber's son, I never met Buber, but I was very close to Buber's son. Um, in Buber's home, he had to be totally quiet, allow the father to work, um, 14 hours a day studying. And that meant that Buber was not available uh, to his children, to others. And he learned that not being available can be a violation of the humanity of the other. But it took him a long time to learn that, uh, to, to pause and respond. Um, so the story that he told us, and I, forgive me if I repeat it, um, 
he came to this realization in a very particular moment. Uh, during the First World War, Ubu was locked in his study, and suddenly, six o'clock in the morning, someone comes knocking on his door. And you don't do that at six o'clock in the morning, and in Germany, you, the custom was you make an appointment. Even today, I guess, you make an appointment. Uh, and then, okay, fine. And in two weeks' time, at one, I will have a half hour for you. But this young man was insistent. And Buber opened the door and realized that he was distraught. It was a soldier. Um, and Buber says, fine, well, I'll give you a half hour. And he was very cordial to the young man. He gave him coffee. Um, and a half hour, he listened to the man's questions. And he replied to those questions. After a half hour, he dangled his, his, his pocket watch. Not so subtly, apparently, to indicate, I gave you that half hour. But he was cordial, he was decent. The man interrupted Buber early in the morning, uh, uninvited, no, res no appointment, but Buber was nice and decent. We would all laud Buber for being so cordial. The following day, Buber learned that this man committed suicide, took his life. And he understood from that is that although he listened to all the questions that were verbally oppo uh, posed, addressed to him, he failed to listen to the questions that were inscribed in the forehead of the person, um, to truly listen. So listening is not simply hearing in the ordinary sense, but it's listening with an inner eye to the reality of the other. And that addresses what Buber calls grace. Uh, and we are to respond accordingly. Well, let me follow up that. Um, you, you, you mentioned that the I thou relationship is interpersonal. And, and since so many of the problems that we face today seem to deal with injustices caused by corporate realities, is it possible for a corporate reality to develop an I thou posture? Mm -hmm. Well, Buba speak, spoke about the, the representatives of the corporate reality, yeah. you and me. <laughs> yeah. um, if we just uh, leave it to be rarefied and reified, and then uh, we allow it to take on its own um, personality, your own momentum, um, and to put it in very <laughs> coarse language, that would be a cop-out. Uh, it's, it's the government, or it's the corporation, or it's the people, uh, and it's not me. No, we are um, the constituents of the of that reality. Um, of course, when we act politically, we organize in order to create a, a counter uh, corporate reality. And that's why politics is so crucial. It's just not simply love. Love would be simply, I care, but gosh, no one else does, or very few. And we must organize ourselves politically and think about how to change political structures. Otherwise, it's not going to be economic and um, social justice. And the prophets are aware that it must be social justice not just simply love. I mean, but it's another part of the answer to you. It's just not compassion and love, but it's an understanding that love must be crowned with justice, must come to fruition through justice. Let's break the barrier, uh, the stage, and open it up uh, as much as we can to the audience um, or to the rest of the community is a better way of putting it. Uh, questions, comments, Thoughts. Sir, you mentioned, you made mention of Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man. Yes, sir. There is a statement that I think it's biblical. There are none so blind as those who will not see. When one espouses this spiritual idea, of treating other people as an entity, what happens when you get no return? What happens when you, as the speaker, is the invisible man? Yes. What happens when you make a proposition for a deal, with, whether it be real estate or political areas or whatever, and the other person doesn't want to listen to you? He ignores you. You do not, for him, exist. How does one combat this? What would Buber or the last right, Moses right, say? Right. Did you all have, I have here 
good question. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if you, can you hear me this way? Uh, fine. I can, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, you can, okay. Uh, just, just to be well, dialogical. Um, I have the courage to walk alone. I have the courage to walk alone with the hope that eventually others will join you. Um, certainly not this despair. Uh, I mentioned the Hasidim, one of the, uh, the, um, the teachings of the Hasidim, these mystical movement uh, which arose within um, East European Jewry, was that despair is the greatest the sin. The greatest, the greatest sin. Um, we have a song that we sing on the Sabbath, which is basically from the teachings of a, of a great Hasidic master. Um, life is a narrow bridge. Those know Hebrew. Life is a narrow bridge. And the main thing is not to despair. Not to despair. Although it's so easy, to, obviously, to let the winds of, of destiny push you over the bridge. Um, but not to despair. I don't know if that's an answer, but it, it is the response I think Google would give me. And it's Martin Luther King. It is an answer. I don't know how practical it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it. Be impractical not to respond. And not to hope. Other questions? Those who heard me and I reiterate what I said, um, that one of the cardinal sins, uh, as understood in certain Jewish traditions, is not to is not to dis is to despair. So we're beholden not to despair. And there's a, uh, a hymn which we sing on which traditional Jews and and uh, well, all Jews, I guess, who participate in the tradition, sing on the Sabbath Eve, which is uh, derived from the this school of thinking called Hasidism, is that life is like a narrow bridge uh, that we must cross. And the main thing is not to despair. Uh, even though the winds of destiny may blow us, uh, at least threaten to throw us off the bridge, we must continue to, um, to cross that bridge uh, with, with hope. Um, and the gentleman asked me, uh, that sounds wonderful, but it's impractical. Um, or it's not practical, I see. I think you put it that way, not practical. And I say it would be impractical not to hope. Paul, I want to pick up on a couple of strands that were, that were opened up with the beginning of the questions. Because, I, I, okay, I buy your answer that in some ways... I'll give you a discount then. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I accept your answer that in some ways we're all capable of the prophetic, and in some ways this is very deeply a part of the Jewish tradition, that, that this is um, part of what the rites and rituals of Judaism are all about, are in some ways to open up spaces of revelation. But it seems to me that what's really at stake in the prophetic has to do with something about how some people are able to channel something transcendent. You and I were sitting in the National Civil Rights Museum and we listened to the speeches of Martin Luther King in, in some of those videos. And every time you hear King articulate these words, yes, there is something that moves through anyone whose ears are even halfway open, yes, that opens you up to something transcendent. And so, yes, in some ways, Buber is calling us to modes of existence that enable us to be open to the other, to the downtrodden, to the widow, the orphan, the uh, um, dispossessed. Um, and, and, and that can be a kind of mode of revelation, you know? Um, but are we, are we really, well, I guess there's two sides to my question. One is, 
in some senses, shouldn't we acknowledge that we're not all prophets? And the real question is, how do we adopt modes of listening, attunement, that enables us to hear the prophetic voice so that we can be transformed by it? That, that, that's sort of one question I'd like you to pick up on. Certainly we're not all prophets, but uh, we're all um, within the context of a, a theistic traditions, our monotheistic traditions, um, to regard ourselves as children of prophets. And let me just expand upon that. Um, and I'll begin with a, uh, an anecdote, a joke, if you wish. So I'm already urging you to laugh when I tell you what I'm going to say. Um, there is uh, an American comedian many years ago who said that, well, to adapt uh, the Ten Commandments to the sensibilities of, co of contemporary America, we should change the terms in the Ten Commandments and call them the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> um, they're not suggestions, they're commandments. Uh, the biblical faith is based on a commandment. Um, the response that to, uh, of someone whose grace has brought us to is in need is not simply, well, it might be nice, but it's a commandment. Uh, and it's not just for the prophets, it's for all of us. The prophets only remind us of the commandments, and that the commandments go beyond simply ritual and prayer, but also our everyday life, our interpersonal life, our social life, our political life, um, must be under the um, under this revealing voice of God that tells us that you've got to do certain things. I understand you studied Kant, or somebody was, I, you know, Kant in many ways picks up on this biblical tradition and regards um, ethics, the way what is legislated for Kant, not by God, but by practical reason, which doesn't mean practical in the sense, but it means reason tells us how to act, in the Greek word praxis, is a commandment. That's what's called a categorical commandment. Absolute overrides all considerations. It's not a question, oh, maybe I'll do that. If it's nice, perhaps I'll be a nice boy. No, it's a commandment. Um, and we often forget that our religious traditions, as we understand God's voice, is a commandment. In Judaism, we call it a mitzvah. Uh, it's a commandment. And also for Buber. It's not something nice that would be, you know, pleasant or the right thing to do. It is <laughs> what we've got to do. Kant calls it duty. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, we call it duties of the heart. Um, so I would just rephrase your question <laughs> in order to give you my answer, <laughs> which is really what we do in academic life, but I also think it's appropriate to indicate that um, um, it's just not a question you said accept, it's not a question of accept, it's a question that you feel that this is what renders you a, a religious person, in our case, a Jewish person. I was wondering whether you would speculate a little on what Buber and King would say in terms of the I-Thou relationship about gay, lesbian, transsexual struggles today. Mm -hmm. um, because it seems to me that all three the Abrahamic traditions are so profoundly characterized by almost unspeakable discrimination against women um, justifications of staggering injustices against women, to begin not speaking of against homosexuals, transsexuals, intersex people. So where do you think the prophetic tradition, if we can speculate on what some of the great prophets of the early part of the 20th century would say, where would that tradition go now with the Thank you, for your, thank you for your question. I hope you all heard it. Um, I, here again, I think we have to uh, revisit and re-examine the concept of tradition. Uh, tradition doesn't mean that which is static, that which is from the past. Uh, it means that which is passed on to us, uh, both in the, in the Latin, from the, the, the etymology of the word tradition, and of course, likewise in Hebrew, the term for tradition is what is passed on and we are to interpret that tradition. In Judaism, we call it the oral law. Um, the written law is there, but it's to be interpreted through our conversation with uh, the written law. Um, and the prophets re remind us, one of the features of the prophets is to remind us that the law is to be interpreted. 
in terms of, of human reality, of concrete social reality, political reality. And I believe that uh, Buber and Martin Luther King were alert to that aspect of tradition. And it's not static, not frozen. Um, sociologically, we make a distinction between tradition and traditionalism. If I may, since it's an academic setting, I'll, let me be a little professorial, you'll forgive me. Um, I, I, you know, I once brought my, my daughter, she's now 35 years old, and I once brought her to one of my classes at the Hebrew University when she was 12. Um, and then uh, when she returned home, uh, my wife, her mother, asked her, how was daddy? And she said, oh, I was I saying Hebrew, and then I was trying, Abba milamet shtuyot, daddy teaches nonsense. Um, <laughs> It's probably true, but it's nonsense <laughs> in big words. Uh, so let me just do, indulge in, in nonsense if you wish, but I hope it has some sense to it. Uh, the distinction between tradition and traditionalism. Traditionalism is the posture of preserving a certain image uh, of a religious community. Um, and that is not necessarily the word of God. Uh, the word of God has to be interpreted. Tradition has a different dynamic than traditionalism. Um, uh, there are traditionalists who would uh, insist that women are and uh, uh, people of, uh, have different sexual inclinations are to be treated as we did 3,000 years ago. Um, but uh, tradition would allow us to reassess uh, the way our grand ancestors had treated these individuals. Um, tradition is dynamic and is always translated anew in the context of uh, and our understanding of, in the contemporary world. I hope it wasn't nonsense. Um. <laughs> yes, please. I just have a comment, not a question. And that is that uh, all the persons, including just the stranger on the street who feels invisible or ignored, to uh, persons who may have a narrow or minority view, a minority position in the grand society. I find that their, their emotional courage is lacking because they're not aware that they have the choice of not allowing the other to be their, their guide or who they must please or who they must get approval from. Well, thank you. Of course, uh, it was suggested uh, in one of the questions that uh, the dialogical posture is to allow the other to enter your world, uh, to break your, your preconceptions, your categories of classifying the other, um, to truly listen, not only to the words, but the, the presence of the other, um, to allow the other to enter your inner reality, or as we would say, to really meet the other. And that takes courage, because sometimes you uh, you're challenged by the other in terms of your own opinions, your own uh, political postures or attitudes. Um, to be open to the other is a, a profound challenge. Sounds simple, sounds platitudinous, but uh, we all know how true it is and how urgent it is. Especially when we think about the we want others to, to let us enter their reality. Um, please. suicide bomber killing innocent people, it's, it would be insane not to feel anger. <laughs> and that would seem to uh, make it hard to maintain the idea of posture. Yes. Um, again, I'm going res to respond humanly and, then f and professorially. Uh, of course, on the human level is that you have to understand their anger and to control it. But anger is clearly um, understand normal and understandable. Um, the professorial way of, of addressing that question um, is to make a distinction between what we call um, conditions of predication as opposed to uh, conditions of non-predication. By that I mean, uh, or philosophers mean, is a uh, predicate, predica you know, is when you come an object. Uh, let me just say it very dramatically, and Jonathan will be my victim. Uh, uh, if I come with a knife, and this is actually a pen, but say it's a knife, 
and I would, uh, every in, in, uh, indication that I'm really intent in plunging that knife into Jonathan, he has every right uh, to defend himself and perhaps wrench that knife from me and even perhaps uh, direct it to me. Uh, that's of course a uh, situation of predication. In a sense, the anger that you experience immediately at, uh, uh, in, in wake of a, of, of a outrageous a crime um, is predication. But upon relaxing or gaining distance from that in the immediate moment, or if Jonathan is here, I heard that Mendes Flaw, he seems like a nice guy, claims he's a nice guy, really is intent on hurting me. Um, at that moment, it's no longer a situation of predication. In other words, a temporal consist moment is different. Um, uh, if he takes the rumor seriously, he may, I think it's 911 here or 411, call and tell the police, you know, this, the man is berserk, uh, crazed, he's, got intent, ten, he's intent on hurting me. Or it may be best for him to run to the airport and flee to uh, uh, where in Miami or San Diego, wherever he, he feels safe. And, um, or perhaps trying to dissuade me. Uh, that, no, Paul, I think got her, Paul is my name. Um, or oh, Pinchas, that's my Hebrew name. <laughs> There's a fellow Pinchas here that I'm just waving. <laughs> uh, you know, to, to try to understand what's the source of my anger and to disarm me, um, not physically, but through dialogue. Um, so I would answer a question. Anger is an immediate response and it's understandable, it's humanly understandable, but um, we must pause and try to understand the circumstances in order to um, prevent, uh, oh, prevent vengeance and prevent the re, if possible, as impractical as it may seem, uh, the, the, uh, the reoccurrence of, uh, of those acts. And I make it very concrete uh, in reference to uh, suicide bombings. Uh, I lived in Israel during the suicide bombings, and of course the response was a moment of defense um, and offense. There's always a strange uh, dialectic between defense and offense. Um, but I would uh, argue with, uh, with my fellow Israelis uh, that um, we must understand the source of the conflict and try to, beyond the moment of predication, try to figure out ways of uh, defusing the conflict. I imagine that's sufficient to make my point clear. Please. I've had an opportunity to visit Israel briefly this summer and uh, speak with people who live there. And I've recognized that people in this country think they know the answer, and none of us know the answer. But could you speak a little more about the situation there? I don't know whether this is the right forum or not. And also, if you're involved in any um, dialogue trying to make a peaceful solution. Right. Uh, and I, I, I'll circumscribe the, uh, the issue, because it's obviously an issue in it of itself. It's all my issue. Right. I almost said I was going to circumcise the issue, but that would be... <laughs> <laughs> Event. Um, if you take circumcision as a, a religious act, I'll try to give you a religious answer. Uh, I'm not a politician, but I am actively, as perhaps can surmise, actively engaged in these questions. And to the degree that I feel uh, um, commanded, I participate in demonstrations. I, well, I, I, they'll be beyond the humble to tell you what I do. But let me just tell you one thing I do do. Uh, with others, um, is we've established di so-called dialogue groups with Palestinians. And that's not a big thing. It's a handful of Jews, Israeli Jews, and a handful of Palestinians. Um, and we meet uh, to discuss what divides us. Uh, and there's a real conflict. Dialogue is not simply saying, oh, I love you and you love me and we'll share tea. Uh, it's a honest and open, as we indicated before, courageous, if you will, uh, confrontation of, of, of the mutual pain that we've experienced uh, 
in the, in the conflict or by virtue of the conflict. It's aggravated by and exacerbated by the conflict. And both Jews and Israel uh, and Palestinians have a long, long litany of complaint, of question. Uh, you did this, suicide bombings, you appropriate, expropriate, exp expropriated our land, you've done this, and, uh, and they're all legitimate complaints. Uh, we've heard each other. Um, in our group, we don't have any pretense that we're going to solve the problems, but just learning to listen and understand one another and forge some basis of understanding with the hope, I guess, uh, that it will seed beyond, uh, beyond the, the small numbers of our uh, encounter groups, dialogue, dialogue groups, uh, something much greater. Um, I think King once said something, that you'll correct me if I don't get the correct quotation. You know, you begin the long march with, with small steps. Uh, and it's not just going to come from here. As the prophet says, it's going to come from you. Um, remember, the prophetic calling or command, I should say, is both a vision and a responsibility. And the responsibility falls on each of us. And we may not know exactly how it's going to be, what's, how it's going to be realized, but we know we have to respond on, on the interpersonal, at the subjective level. You know, in Jewish tradition, and I may just give you a little bit of what we call Yiddishkeit, Jewish, we have extended the concept of, of a commandment. The Hebrew word for commandment, as we find in the Hebrew Bible, is mitzvah. Um, God gives a certain amount of, of commandments. But there is also what we call, give the term, supererogatory mitzvahs. It means it's not called upon, but you know you should do it. Um, uh, and that is the, what you call sometimes a good deed, but it's a good deed that you know you should do, uh, like helping someone to cross the street. Or if you see um, uh, litter, uh, and you feel that, it, that sh you should not leave that litter for uh, an indentured servant or an underpaid employee to pick up, but that you should, as uh, one who shares this space, uh, pick up. Um, I have an obsession with picking up litter, but nonetheless, uh, and I always justify it to myself as this is a mitzvah. Uh, and of course, the, the mitzvahs, everyday life, the way you respond to people, the world around you, uh, you see it as a commandment. And it's little things, but it's really what ultimately, what we call the Jewish tradition, that repairs the world. We call it tikkun olam. Um, and that's what each of us do in our everyday life. Um, Buber would expand upon this and call it the life of dialogue. And King certainly would agree. So you believe that it's possible to take maybe the prophetical works of the three Martins and use them for other minorities such as the lesbian, lesbian, gay, transsexual, bisexual community? As I responded, yes, it's a good question. As I responded to the previous question, most certainly, most certainly it's, a, it's applicable to all of us who are um, uh, feel ourselves to be abused, misunderstood, exploited, all who feel vulnerable to the the prejudices of uh, of society. Certainly. Well, I want to take uh, the the the, the um, privilege of asking the last question, which is um, to follow on the quote from King that that it's a long march, but we have to begin with small steps. Um, Heschel, another great Jewish thinker of the 20th century, said that when he uh, marched with King, he was praying with his feet. Right. I'm wondering whether or not, and prayer, of course, in Judaism is, is it's supposed to be preparation for right. um, acts of social justice, which are the frame, and, and you've given that to us beautifully tonight. Did Buber have a notion of how we prepare ourselves so that the I thou is not only an interruption. It's it, I don't, it does, it, it's not only an act of grace that comes from without. Right. Um, it's a complicated question. Behind the question is of course the knowledge that Buber did not pray in the ordinary sense. He didn't go to synagogue for a variety of reasons. And the most uh, um, decisive reason is that he felt it was urgent for us to, at this juncture in our cult and our civilization uh, to learn to serve God in the everyday world, not just synagogues or churches, not to be satisfied with prayer and ritual 
in our service to God, but to learn to serve God in the nitty gritty of our everyday existence. Preparation, of course, is a question of how you, of self-understanding, of, of um, self-exploration. Um, the Greeks call it to know thyself. Um, and to know ourselves not just simply intellectually and, and such, but also in terms of our values and our inner structure. Today we have a different understanding, or at least a more subtle understanding of what it means to be sinful. Um, not just to, a, um, in the Bible often it's referred to sin as just simply not observing God's commandments. But to be sinful as we understand it today is of course to be aware of our prejudices, our uh, anger, uh, our fears. Um, and that's all part of the preparation to be um, a dialogical person. Or I would simply say in the Jewish tradition, which I understand Jonathan evoked at his inauguration as a, as a professor here, to be a mensch, to be a truly decent human being. Um, it's not just being nice, but also in order to be nice, if you want to put it in, in a simple way, is to, is to understand yourself uh, and the way we when we construct the world, we all construct the world according to our values, our ideologies, our religious identities, our cultural identities, personal identities. And that can often obscure the way we actually are, attend to the life of being a human being, um, or the challenge of, of being a human being. To know thyself. Uh, in Judaism, Judaism, we call it cheshbon nefesh, to make an account of our, our souls. But we should do that not only, not only once a year, but every day. Uh, I just want to uh, make this uh, w one point about Martin King with respect to the gay, lesbian, transsexual, uh, bisexual issue. Bayard Rustin was the tactical logician for King. Bayard Rustin is the man, along with Stanley Levison, who was another Jewish brother up in New York, King would get on the phone and they would talk and strategize about what to do with the movement. What this does is this deconstructs the notion that King knew all the answers before time. Many times he was scrambling and he had people to help him. But back to the point on Bayard Rustin, it was known that Bayard Rustin was a black gay man. In the 50s and 60s in America, you, a, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was hard enough being black in America then. Now you're going to add being black and gay. And even people in King's movement, certainly the black nationalists, uh, with their, with their, with their uh, embrace of Frantz Fanon and others, railed against Bayard Rustin's influence in the movement. Uh, rewind back to Mississippi summer. They're down there trying to register voters down there in Mississippi. Bayard Rustin gets up to speak. And some of the black nationalists there, the, the black power movement people said, if, if he stays in the, in the room, then we'll leave it. Martin stands up and puts his coat on. He says, if you all kick Bad Rustin out of the movement, then I'm gone. Now hush falls down on the meeting. Because if Martin isn't down there in Mississippi, the cameras aren't there. Because he was good copy. Wherever he went, the cameras was going. Plus the fact that people give into the movement. We're in a different moment. King goes back and two weeks later translates in this into loving others. His collection of sermons called Strength to Love, King Argus. It's not the uh, ex existential piece of people that, that you should be concerned about. What skin color it is, what melanin content, the elliptical curl of their hair, how wide their nose and lips are. This is hogwash. King said it's the fundamentum of the person that counts. He once said about Jesus, he said, look, if all the Jewish brothers and sisters in Memphis told me, Martin Luther King Jr., we have enough Jewish power to deal with anti-Semitism in America, he said, I'm still going to stand up and say it's morally wrong because Jews are our brothers and sisters. He couches in the image of God. I am absolutely positive. Man, I, look, if I was a bad man, I'd bid all y'all's paychecks out there tomorrow. That Martin King would embrace the notion that your sexual preference or your sexual politics was immaterial to your being human. And that that was the first thing, recognize your humanity. Then there are gonna be differences. Some of them will be legitimate, some of them illegitimate. But here we have a paradigm with King. 
for loving other people, not because you like them, he says, but because God loves them. And, I, and I, somebody, somebody's going to write the book on Martin Luther King Jr. and the gay lesbian community. I think Mark Bear ought to be the one to write it. But uh, I, that needs to be lifted up in American consciousness, that Martin King did have interaction with gays and lesbians. It didn't even stop with Bayard Rustin. There were others in the movement who were afraid to come out on it. They were so-called in the closet, so to speak. But he didn't just talk about the race issue. He talked about other issues as well. In the marvelous letter that Dr. Paul quoted from the letter of Birmingham jail, you know that's 1963, but he was assassinated in 68. This brother has five and a half more years of speeches, walking, marches, active prayer, and prayerful acts. If we get into some of those, we'll see the full range that I think you are pointing us to about the I Thou piece and the devotion and the ethics and how they go together. But I was just, um, I just felt a prophetic pathos. I just had to say that about Martin. Amen. <laughs> Let's uh, thank again, please, uh, the faculty of uh, Rhodes College and uh, Dr. Paul Mendes Floor and all of you for being here. We'll continue the conversation for a short while individually. Please join us again February 7th. Good night. I thank you. Please.